So anyway, integrative biophysics. That's the field of, by the way, the field of medicine is headed right into electrical medicine. Did anybody ever hear Nasir uh, Hassan talk? Nassim, he was on Time Magazine, he's a physicist. Guy is unbelievable. He solved Einstein's equations. He's in his 40s, he lived in Hawaii. That's right, you're from Hawaii. That's right, I met you before. We, we drank some water. What's your name again? Scott. Scott, yeah, Scott and I drank a little blue water together. You know, we bonded. And uh, uh, it's amazing that you know Nassim. He's a good friend. Oh, smartest guy I've ever met. Oh, okay, good, good. Thank you for that proper pronunciation. That's the right pronunciation, Scott? Yes, but I'm Scott. That's Scott, all right. But anyway, <laughs> when, I, when I met Nassim, we were talking about zeta potential. And because uh, I was looking for a perfect water, and uh, we were talking about zeta potential, how the zeta potential thins the water. It's like water being wetter. And uh, in his presentation, he was talking about how red blood cells there's a force between red blood cells, and that red blood cells in our body function at the speed of light. Think, think about that. Our red blood cells are turning at 186,000 miles per second. That's unbelievable. Now, I've got to tell you, as a cardiologist, I did 3,000 angiograms in a cath lab, and I was amazed when I was 30 years old, when I was a fellow in cardiology, we would put rubber bands around an artery, and we would cut an artery and stick a catheter in the artery, and then we would inject the heart would die, and the heart would light up like a Christmas tree, and we would see blockages. But sometimes those rubber bands would slip, and I'll never forget it as long as I lived. I will never forget this. If a rubber band slipped, that artery would squirt blood out and hit the ceiling 30 feet across the room. And what I got was that well, that's why people bleed out from a gunshot wound within 30 seconds if you hit a major artery. But what I really got was how the heart can torque the blood. So think of it this way. When the heart contracts and it, 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 it twists like this, and the blood gets torqued, and the blood's spinning at 186,000 miles a second, well, the heart is an unbelievable organ, unbelievable, where it can have that force and, and throw that blood out. And now Pauling talked about when red blood cells start to lose vitamin C, they get knocked off by the spleen. Because what happens is when they get older, they can't keep up with their younger counterparts and they can't function at 186,000 miles per second. So the body, in its wisdom, takes them out with the spleen. And then our bone marrow makes no, new red blood cells. So in essence, we're electrical beings. You know, we're not flesh and bones. We're electric. We're electric. So, the heart, being an electrical organ, is the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable to toxic electrical stress, but it's the most susceptible to healing forces of, 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 of harmonious waves that can nurture the heart. So, We'll go with this, and we'll, and we'll talk about vibrational medicine, and hopefully we'll uh, uh, get some good information. I've got to take this jacket off because I'm getting hot under the lights. Um, this is a rose. It's from a uh, textbook of uh, John Paracas. He was an, a bioenergetic spiritual therapist. Um, and it shows that when a rose opens up, there's an energy attached to that plant. You know, all plants have energy. Gemstones have energy. Quartz has energy. And in the human body, we have an energy field around us, you know, the aura of the body. And then we have our chakras. We have these areas of the body that have intensified areas of, of energy. And that fourth chakra there, you can see it, the heart chakra uh, in the back, is the area that I worked with as a cardiologist. Now, I spent um, um, 10 years in bioenergetic psychotherapy. And what bioenergetic psychotherapy is about is energy blocks. If you have an energy block in your body, the energy becomes stagnant, well, that section of the body can be prone to disease. For example, people who are constipated all the time or obstipated, they don't move or are more prone to bowel cancer, you know, as an example. People who don't breathe right, uh, frozen diaphragms, uh, barrel chest, 
with a lot of heartbreak, don't expand their chest, get coronary disease. And there's a lot of science behind it. You know, they put out more thromboxine, their blood clots faster, they don't breathe as well. But anyway, in heart disease, I wrote the book Heartbreak and Heart Disease back when I was 42 years old. And uh, what, what I got when I wrote that book was that how powerful emotional factors are in heart disease. It's almost like cancer. You know, with cancer, I mean, every patient that I know with cancer has some sort of emotional conflict going on, either consciously or unconsciously. In cardiac disease, there's an emotional conflict, but, but it, more has, it has more to do with heartbreak and the loss of unconditional love. And basically, um, if we don't have unconditional love when we're growing up, well, then we develop a false self. You know, it can be called a coronary-prone personality, a type A behavior pattern. You can give it certain names, but if you don't have unconditional love, then you associate love based on success. <laughs> or, so the body or the unconscious drive makes up the rule, well, if I become successful, if I become a politician, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, somebody will love me. You know? And that sets the stage for coronary prone behavior. So the loss of love, and it can happen with the loss of a parent, a divorce, a loss of a pet, I've had all sorts of scenarios in my practice. So basically, the healing power of love is just unbelievable. Look, when you fall in love, what happens to your cells? They dance, they vibrate. They vibrate, they dance. You're happy, you're joyful when you're in love. And people don't get sick. And then there's a nice study of pets. You know, Jim Lynch did this uh, study years ago now. Um, I'm going to interview Jim Lynch uh, uh, for one of my newsletters, you know, and, uh, and talk about any more research he has on the healing power of love. But he did the work in dogs, where if you pet a dog, your blood pressure goes down. And, and then there was a study that came out later, and, and basically the study showed that if you had a heart attack, and you came home to a pet, a cat, or a loving dog, your incidence of a recurrent heart attack or death was 500% lower than if you came home to a judgmental spouse. <laughs> so, when I read that article, I got three dogs. <laughs> I have two chows and an elk count. And my, my elk count, Charlie, he passed away about four years ago. He was 16. And the vet said, I've never seen a dog with a stronger heart. And Charlie's been taking CoQ10 for... 15 of his 16 years. <laughs> and then I had Chewy, my, my chow, which absolutely was the most loving dog I've ever had in my life. She's like, an, she had an angel in her. I am convinced she had a, an angel in that body. And uh, we lost her this year in January at 14. You know, and now I have another chow. Uh, she's 11. And uh, I have to tell you, when you make contact with an animal, and you look in their eyes, and you make contact, and you can take in that love of that four-legged creature, oh man, it's incredible. Now for you ladies out there who have a tough time trusting the opposite sex, and if you men have the same problem with the opposite sex, pays to get a dog of the opposite sex. I mean, you can save $100,000 in psychotherapy, you know? <laughs> it works. It absolutely works. So pets are a must. So anyway, I was driving yesterday, and I saw this, I mean, at a light, and there's this beautiful Malamute, Malamute, and I used to have an Alaskan Malamute, a real one from Alaska, because I practiced in Alaska for a while. I was a young doctor up there. And uh, this dog, pokes his head out, and he has these almond eyes, and he's a beautiful marked Malamute. And I said to the driver, I said, Malamute or Husky? And he goes, I don't know. I just picked it up from the pound. And I said, good for you, you know? And anyway, go to a pound and adopt something, you know? And, you know, give it a home. Anyway, bioenergetic medicine. Now, it's kind of interesting. I studied bioenergetic psychotherapy when I came out of my residency and fellowship. And now I'm talking about bioenergetic medicine. Well, it's a study of energy transformation. 
So every cell must have a way of obtaining energy. Now, detoxification is also an energetic process. When my son was sick, his temperature went down to 95 degrees. When you are sick, your body temperature goes down because you don't have the energy, you can't produce the ATP. It takes an enormous amount of ATP to keep the body up to 98.6. So sick people have lower energy, they have lower temperature. And when I see people with a lower temperature, what happens is the cells can't take in nutrients, they can't expel waste, and when the temperature gets lower, microbials increase, and you get more viruses and bacteria in the body, and more parasites, the body gets activated, and the immune system just falls apart. I saw a far infrared sauna here. Far infrared sauna is one of the best ways of healing the body. I'm gonna talk about that later. But the more you sweat, the more you get rid of toxins, because a lot of toxins, insecticides and pesticides are in a subcutaneous fat. So, and, and, and the sauna is one of the best ways of getting rid of bacterial infections. And I'll never forget a famous cancer guy. I won't reveal his name. Um, his wife came down with breast cancer, and he said to me, he goes, the thing that saved my wife's life was she was in a foreign infrared sauna every day and cooked that cancer to death. <laughs> cooked it. You know what cancer doesn't like? Doesn't like oxygen. Doesn't like vitamin C or hydrogen peroxide. What does it like? Loves sugar. Loves sugar. Loves dark anaerobic metabolism. Locks, it, it, it loves a blood supply that can't, you know, nurture it, you know, uh, that can't get to the cells.